Okay. Um, I hope you've been blessed by what you've heard. God always speaks. God always speaks. And it's a wonderful thing to know that God can speak through you. It's not a flattering thing, but it's the way God operates. And um, God has spoken to me quite a bit. And he's always trying to, as we had just heard, God is trying to strengthen the muscles that are weak. And he really wants to increase our strength in different areas. Uh, let me just underline a couple of things that I've heard from the folks. Um, like a child serving his father. That's what it says about, um, about Paul, Timothy. How he served Paul. Furthering the gospel like a child serving his father. Uh, there was somebody speaking at the conference that I was at, and he was talking about how different fathers, uh, there are good examples and bad examples of fathers in the Bible. And we don't know much about Timothy's father. He almost seems like an absentee father. We know about, much about the faith. We know about the faith of his mother and his grandmother, but his father is completely absent, may not even been converted. And here was Paul, the father that um, Timothy never had. But Timothy preserved that simple, childlike faith. So don't think that just because you didn't have a good father, that you don't have a ministry. That may be the very reason you maintain a simplicity in devotion to Jesus. Because you didn't have it. And Timothy is an example in that. That he found in, in Paul. He said, I found a father figure. Paul writes his two letters in 1 Timothy and 1 2 Timothy. He calls him my dearly beloved son. My child in the faith. Paul and Timothy had that father relationship. Do you, um, do you envision that as being possible in the Christian life? That you can interact with people and not necessarily have a father relationship, or whatever it is, but to have that family relationship with brothers and sisters in the church. And that you can maintain it for the rest of your life and grow in it. And that for those who we look up to, that we can maintain a simplicity of like a child serving his father. We have not a complicated mind that's saying, I figured it out, I've understood it, but that he will continue to serve me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving the father. Are there, is there somebody we are indebted to because of so much that they, the Lord has taught us? For me, I, for example, I think of somebody like my personal dad, not because of what he gave me in, this, in the physical realm, but in the spiritual realm. It's so easy for me to know whether I have the same theology as him, but am I furthering the gospel? being so indebted for all that he's opened my eyes to, serving him like a child serves a father, uncomplicated, simply. Um, from what Wen Hai had shared, faith is for the impossible. The great danger is when we see a command of God that's very difficult, that we lower the standard. We run away from it. So we lower the standard. It's the human response. It's the animal response. Fight or flight. So I either fight it, saying, no, God, you really didn't mean it that way. Let me figure out the Greek so I can lower it, lower it, lower it, so it's manageable. I'll run away from it. No, I'm not going to do it. If the challenge is to keep God's standard, God's standard. Read his words simply. Like a child reads his father's instructions. Very simply. Clean your room. Love one another as I have loved you. These, it's simple. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't lower the standard. But you can't do it. You can't do it. That's why you need to have faith. Faith is not to make your first million. Faith is not to get a high house. Faith is to obey the commands of God. The assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. I can't see how I can love one another as Christ has loved me. Exactly. That's why you need faith. That's why faith is so important for the things that God's commanded us to do. God doesn't give us commands that are possible. He gives us commands that are impossible. And He says that's why you need faith. Don't lower the standards. Seek God for more and more faith. Lord, you have said that these commands are not going to be burdensome. Right now it's a big burden. Lord, you need to give me faith. 
that I can achieve what is not possible. And we've talked a lot about recently about Abraham. Faith that a hundred year old can have a baby. That's it. It's the same kind of impossibility that God makes the impossible possible for us. So let us not shrink back with God's impossible commands because he's divine. Of course it's supposed to be impossible for us to match up to it. It's completely understandable that God's commands, His holiness and His perfection will be unattainable. God says, that's why you need faith. You need to hold on to me. You need to have a conviction and an assurance that He will do it. That's faith. Not that, no, Lord God, you're going to, by gritting my teeth, I'm going to do it. No, you will do it in me. I'm not going to lose my conviction of that. Don't simply focus on your lack. We must also give thanks. Surin said, I was with the young people in, in North Carolina, and we, we, one of the exercises we asked them to do was to paraphrase Romans chapter 6, verses 8 through 11. And Romans chapter 6, verse 11 says, Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. We asked them to paraphrase that whole passage 8 through 11, but 11 just says that even consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And I'll tell you what I've noticed in myself. The great tendency for me is to focus on the first half of that verse. To consider myself dead to sin. And that's important. We hear a lot about considering ourselves dead to sin. But can you, and I, maybe we can explain what it means to consider myself dead to sin. I can say, well, this is what it means when I interact with money. This is what it means when I am tempted to get angry. And this is what it means when I see, when I'm dealing with the lust of my eyes. And I know all of those things. So I can explain to other people what it means to be dead to sin. Can you also explain what it means to be alive to God? I found that that muscle is weak. I don't know what it means to be alive to God in Christ Jesus. It's right there. It's the same verse. Do one and do the other. Consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. And so we have to focus not just on consider yourself dead to sin. Sin is taken very seriously by us. But I noticed that in my Christian life and for those who take sin seriously, the danger is to not be able to talk with joy what it means to be alive in God. Yes, I can talk in my mind, I'm going to go to heaven. All kinds of things, and I can watch the passion movie and do all those different things, read an email, see a, a report, and have a temporary boost of praise. But I don't want to live a lifestyle of being alive to God in Christ Jesus. Maybe we sing some songs and I feel a little bit alive to God in Christ Jesus. But I can't explain, I don't have a lifestyle of that. So for those of us who take sin seriously, let us do both. Let us believe in a Christ who died and was raised. It's a depressing religion for a Christ who just died. It's a depressing religion for people who just try to consider themselves dead to sin. It's the same analogy. Jesus died, you died. Jesus rose, you rose. And Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 15. If you just consider the deadness of Christ, you're of all people most to be pitied. You have to believe in the resurrection. Yeah, that you're going to go to heaven, but that you're alive in Christ. So let's also remember that. And um, both the stories of what P shared and Nettie shared, uh, these are all areas in which we have to allow our faith to be stretched. And I hope those of us who are young, who are teenagers, who are in school, will take attention, pay attention to this stuff. Who are involved with these things too. I know that the Lord is always testing us if we will be bold. And I personally believe that in my own life, God has been so merciful to me, not comparing myself to anybody else, but God has been so merciful to me. I think, I'd like to share this with my children, that one of the reasons I feel God has been so merciful to me is because I've, re I've, in my life, spotted times in my life, I have sought to honor Him, even at the expense of my own honor. 
where I knew I was going to be embarrassed, where I knew I was going to feel the opportunity to just be embarrassed. And this was, um, when I think of it in high school and I think of it in college, there are distinct areas in which I felt like I did things that to stand up for God, even in my foolishness. But the Lord saw my heart that I wanted to honor Him. And He pays attention to that. There's a verse my dad keeps on reminding me in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. Those who honor me, I will honor. It's a very comforting verse for us young people who are in schools, in colleges. It's good for us to teach our children at a young age. Look, honor God. Yes, you'll face ridicule. Maybe the next person who comes might mutter <laughs> crazy things at you. Those who honor me, I will honor you. And that must be our confidence. Blessed are you when men persecute you because of my name. Those are also in there. We praise God that there are a lot of people who are hurting, who really are blessed by even by the wonderful messages of what Christianity has. But even when they don't accept it, this must be our rock. If I honor God, God will honor me. He didn't make the pain of the peer pressure rejection any easier, but He honored me by showering me with mercy. And now as I look back, I'll take the peer pressure rejection for the mercy He gave me in allowing me to stop making much more foolish mistakes that have, could have ruined my life. And that's kind of where our math just does not, we don't understand the purposes of God. And God's grace and God's, um, God's wisdom far exceeds us. We just have to do our part. And we may face ridicule in a small area, but you watch how the Lord will honor you. Um, in different areas of your life. That's been my testimony. And, um, you know, also, we are all sensitive. We are all sensitive to how, what people think about us. And it's one of those areas where we have to realize, when I, when I was hearing Peace Story, I thought that's exactly how I would respond. Thinking that he had an issue with me, or thinking that he's intentionally trying to rub it in me. And I had a good parent. <laughs> So it's not just those who don't have good parents who feel that way. At least I can relate completely with that. And um, how we must see these as tests that the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us and that we can pass more successfully. I wanted to share something from Jude. Jude is the second last book in the Bible right before Revelation. But this is something that the Lord has laid on my heart, and I wanted to at least start to share it this week. Jude, verse 17. Jude, chapter 1, there's only one chapter, but Jude, verse 17 and 18. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That they were saying to you that in the last day time there shall be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly minded, devoid of the Spirit. That's what Jude 17 through 19. And I wanted to grab a hold of that last phrase, devoid of the Holy Spirit. We have talked a lot in the last couple of months or two, three months about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And in order for us to understand a fuller understanding of what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, it is good to see the opposite of that, which is those who are devoid, empty. That's what devoid means, empty of the Holy Spirit. And so as I protect myself from getting empty of the Holy Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, I think, quench not the Holy Spirit. If I find that, how did these people become empty? Because they quenched the Holy Spirit. If I look at these attributes of those people who are empty of the Holy Spirit, I can guard myself as I seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Spirit is freely given by the Father to those who eagerly seek Him like a child asks for bread that's what Luke 11 tells me the Father gives the Holy Spirit the problem is there can be things that I do to quench Him so He gives it to me and I quench it right away He lights the match and then I pour my water right on it and I keep praying Lord fill me with the Holy Spirit and He did and I kept pouring water on Him and quenching it so and then I blame God saying God He didn't fill me with the Holy Spirit He did these are ways in which we can quench the Holy Spirit to where we get the, it emptied and so we say Lord you fill me with the Holy Spirit but we find ourselves empty maybe this can be helpful for some of us and we find that scripture continues to repeat the same things over no matter, no matter what passage you look at that's what I love about scripture but it says there that in the last time there shall be mockers following after their own god, ungodly lust now those are people in the world but I too am somebody who find myself following my un own ungodly lust at times now if you were to tell me I am a mocker of God I would say no that's not true but the Bible tells me that I am one how am I mocking God when I follow my own ungodly lusts I believe that I want to try to just make it a little bit clearer how I understand this who are you being led by Jesus said came to this earth and he didn't give me a program on how to live he said follow me and that's the message of Jesus he stands at the door and knocks and he says I, I say Lord come in and he says now follow me now I can choose to follow him or I can choose to follow my own lusts that's Jude verse 18 I'm following my own lusts so when I hear the voice of Jesus who says follow me and my lust saying follow me both are saying follow me I get to decide who I follow when I follow my lusts I'm insulting God very simply I don't know if I saw it quite as well as me being a mocker but I'm laughing in God's face when Jesus is telling me to follow me but I also want to explain to you what I'm laughing in God's face about and use an analogy to show you that if you turn with me to Genesis chapter 1 Jesus gave humans a command and hopefully by this picture you'll be able to see how much of a mockery it is when we disobey God's command and God's blessing over us when God made man and woman it says in verse 27 Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 and 28 God created man in his own image in the image of God he created him male and female so it's not just the men it's the males and the females God's created them in God's image and God blessed both male and female and God said to them be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule rule over the fish over the sea over the birds of the sky and over every living thing now I think that's generally true about humans we tend to rule over the animals I don't think you would walk around the earth saying we're scared because we just don't know how to control these animals God has given us the ability as humans to rule over animals how much what a what a mockery it is when I see when if we were to see an animal leading a man sometimes maybe we see some dogs in America whose <laughs> rules <laughs> the owners maybe that's the closest we've kind of come to it but I had this picture of a man leading a cow we see this all the time in India a man leading the cow and the cow is just being dragged by the noose around the neck and that's leading tell me how laughable it would be if I saw it the other way around with a cow dragging a man or a woman 
Do you know how absurd that is? We've never, I've never seen it. But can you picture that? How absurd it is? And the reason it's absurd is because God created us that way. And God set a rule and said, you rule. And we've ruled. Over the birds and the fish and every created thing. Every living thing that moves on this earth. The cow, we've subjected it. The lion, the elephant, we've subjected all of them. Every single animal. Yes, we know their boundaries. We know how to put them and where they need to be in their proper place. But where in doubt, we'll kill them. If a lion comes and attacks me, I know how to kill them. Don't think lions have figured out how to kill us. They won't. Because God's created a rule. And said, you're going to rule over it. And he's commanded it. And he's given us that authority. That it is a mockery when I see a cow leading a man. It is a shameful perversion of what... The, and I would try to tell him, do you know this is a complete upside down reality in which you live? Now, for the spiritual Christian, I need to see it's exactly the same way. When, they, when I read Romans 6.14. God's created another rule. The problem is, we have not seen in the spiritual world what is so ob obvious in the physical world. Where God has also said, has commanded you and blessed you. Every person who is in Christ, who has the Holy Spirit as a seed, as a pledge of our inheritance in God, God has also now given us another blessing. Romans 6.14 Sin shall not rule over you. You shall rule over sin. Now you compare that with Genesis 1.28. God said, you shall rule over the fish and the cow and the elephant. And I said, it is so. We did it. We look around and we see the humans have, have achieved that. The problem is our spiritual people who live in the new agreement, where it's not the tangible but the intangible, the spiritual things, is it as much of a truth that God's commanded it? You shall rule over your sins. There's no two ways about it. And the challenge for us as Christians is to, to realize how absurd it is. Not how depressing it is, not how discouraging or shameful it is, how absurd it is for us to call ourselves Christians, to have the Spirit of God inside of us, and God give us a command saying, rule over sin. And if God was to look at our lives and as the angel look at our lives, I'm like an animal being led by sin on all fours, scared whenever the sin pops up, always knowing that the sin has mastery over me. I'm not saying you should always get victory over sin, that you should be sinlessly perfect. You should know me now by then, and I'm not saying that. But do you feel it's master over you? Is there any sin in your life that you feel? I don't even have a handle on it. You should treat it like that animal that doesn't, you don't have mastery over. You shouldn't take it very seriously. It will destroy you. It's like these animals that don't know how to, their proper place, and the masters come back, and they've wrecked their whole living room, torn up all the pillows. It's a big mess. And all they do is coddle the pet and say, oh, I'm so sorry. You should take it seriously. If the animal is doing that in your house, you should take it seriously if sin has, doesn't have that, has that kind of control in your life. If it's an uncontrollable tongue, if it's an eyes that are constantly taking you back to places it shouldn't go, if it's ways of speaking. I hope you're distinguishing between falling and having mastery. I'm not talking about falling. We should take falling seriously. But I'm talking about, is there any sin that has mastery over you? That you know that once in eight weeks it's going to get you. And some animals are smart enough to know that it's going to not attack whenever, but they'll attack at the opportune time. 
Is there some sin like that in your life? But you know. I'll ignore it the first time she says it. I'll ignore it the second time she says it. But the fifth time she says it, I get back at her. My spouse or whoever it is. Is that the way it is? Please think about this picture. God created humans to rule in the physical realm and in the spiritual realm. Ah, tell yourself, Lord, this is absurd. This is utter foolishness, the way my life is. The way I've been a Christian for five years, and I still have made not the progress I should in the way I control my tongue. Once a quarter, I still take it out on my wife. It is absurd that this sin continues to have that little rule over me. When we take it seriously, then we'll start to make progress. And I fear that we take wild animals in our house more seriously than we take wild sin in our lives. And that's where we are more earthly than we are spiritual. And I want to take the next couple of weeks, I mean, to also talk about that, about being devoid in the spirit. I mean, I think you guys can do the math in terms of verse 19 where it talks about divisions and being worldly minded, being earthly minded, but it's right there. These are things we've been talking a lot about, the unity that we need to have, not ones who create divisions and worldly minded, but I'll share more about that next week. Um, but I hope that that picture will stay with us. I hope that we will recognize that the Lord commanded humans to rule over animals and we've done it. And God has commanded Christians to rule over their bad moods and their sins of speaking in anger and having loose tongues and judging other people over and over again and having an unforgiving spirit towards our mother-in-laws, our father-in-laws, our brothers, our fathers. And God wants us to rule. This is a promise. And if you think it's impossible, like many of God's promises, you must have faith. We'll not, we will not lower the standard. We will keep the standard exactly the same. It's ruling. Are you a ruler of all these wild animals that used to roam around in your heart? that used to bite other people, that used to bite your spouses, that used to bite your children, bite, bite your siblings. Have they been tamed? Have they been domesticated? Yes, I know we have a couple of incidents every now and then that flare up, but we're quick to hear the correction of the Holy Spirit that says, stop that from becoming a big thing now. Stop that dog from thinking it can rule. Starting to think it can rule again. Stop that wild beast in your heart, in your flesh, from thinking it can rule. Take it seriously. And if we do, we'll start to find that the, those things that were wild beasts in the land start to know their place. Bad moods, feelings of discouragement, they start to know their place. They start to realize, I'm going to get a whack every time that happens. Maybe I won't do that as much as anymore. It's like snakes that come out of the hole in India. Keep whacking it. They'll find a different place to come out. But you're not coming out of this hole much anymore. I'm ready with the stick. I'm not trying to talk about abusing animals, but your hearts, your sins. <laughs> sins in your hearts. You come to India and you tell me what you'll do with the snakes and then you tell me how you'd attack them. Maybe you'll be nice to them and gently ask them to leave. <laughs> still find that most people in India hit them with a stick. <laughs> if you be gentle to the animals, what about the beast in your heart? However you want to do, what are the beast in your heart? The wild animals that are ruling, the little foxes, Song of Solomon, the little foxes that are ruining the vineyards, cute little sins, catch them. Let's take our lives seriously. Let's, cl let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, I um, pray, Lord, that you may increase our seriousness. We don't want to be devoid of the Holy Spirit. We want to be filled up, Lord, and we don't want to be mockers who are following our corrupting lusts. 
Lord, we want to understand the principle of the rule that you've given us. You bless us and you command us and tell us rule. Lord, may this sink deep into our hearts, Lord. Let us never tolerate sins that start to rule over us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I wanted to take also a few minutes. Yeah. I wanted I didn't want the youth stream to be on just because I didn't feel like it necessary for um, everybody to hear. But I wanted to share with you, since I absolutely believe